This is uh, something that happened uh, piece by piece, as strange as this may sound. I'm trying to remember exactly where it all happened. That was a that's something we got to talk about in the future. But that was a I I don't know that I was ever more incoherent and I. I mean that night is like is like some kind of dream, a very blurry, very nightmarish, and I had trouble piecing it together. But we'll, uh, it's going to take me a while to work on that. When notorious serial killer Ted Bundy opens his mouth and confesses on audio tape to raping and mutilating multiple young women most audiences edge closer to their speakers. Did you ever bury anybody? Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, in my, yeah, in, in my, uh, you might say, my more uh, coherent, uh, not coherent, that's when I was really going all out to, and, and took my time. Yes, I did. And, I mean, it's, it's quite clear. I mean, there's no question about it. Almost without question, those who have been found were not, and those who haven't been found were there. It's morbid curiosity with a touch of horror that makes us want to keep listening. Lord knows what, what the little creatures up there did, what the animals would have done. But for criminal profilers like Pete Klismet, listening to Bundy and hundreds of other killers, perverts, and child predators over the course of his career, these rare recordings create a very different set of emotions. I would reach into my left pocket and pull out the card that says, drop dead, and we will see you later, because all you're trying to do is pull my chain and jerk us around, and I don't even want to talk to you. So shut your mouth, here's your cuffs, here's the guy that'll take you back to your cell. Good luck on that. Uh, in a couple of days, then, um, you know, you'll meet your maker. I'm investigative reporter Chris Halsney. In this episode of Interview with Evil, Ted Bundy's FBI Confessions, you're going to get an insider's look at how and why the FBI first formed its psychological profiling unit in the late 70s, and how Ted Bundy still 30 years after being put to death for his crimes, is teaching the next generation of detectives. From his home in Colorado, retired FBI criminal profiler Pete Klesmet keeps busy teaching and writing books on the criminal mind and consulting with local law agencies regarding unsolved murders. He was working as a homicide detective in Ventura, California in 1984 when he first heard that the Federal Bureau of Investigation was starting up an intriguing new science unit dedicated to predicting how serial killers think and act. My boss seemed to like me because he said, you know, what I want to do is send you to this uh, school on psychological profiling. So I said, you know, essentially, what the hell is that? Because I didn't know. I wasn't paying attention to that kind of stuff. I was too busy running around doing all kinds of, you know, other stuff. Arrested bank robbers, gamblers, you name it. Way before the CSI, and you see all the Hollywood, you know, profiling stuff. This was Absolutely. this was a new a new science. Yes, well, not so much of a science, Chris. I'd have to say it was more of a more of an art. About fifteen or twenty percent of the original FBI profilers had any of what Klesmit labels street experience. I had had handcuffs on in ten years. Uh, you know, several hundred people. So former cops like him teamed up with PhDs in psychology, accountants, and attorneys to bring different perspectives to solving the most difficult and sadistic crimes in the country. I went through profiling boot camp, as I call it, and uh, it was nasty. It was one of the worst things I'd ever seen in my life. And again, you know, not having fallen off the turnip truck, I'd seen a lot of things. I mean, I'd seen a lot of dead bodies and a lot of pretty horrible things. 
I saw things there that nobody should ever see. I'll help you catch him, Clary. Believe me, you don't want Hannibal Lecter inside your head. When they were called in on murder cases, um, the things that were exemplified, I guess, in Silence of the Lambs, for example, um, encompassed several different movies, or several different people into the movie. Um, Ed Gein, a guy that would uh, rob graves and steal women's bodies and, and would skin them and use their skin for backings on the chair and seats and just all, all kinds of horrible stuff. I'm like, you know, I wasn't ready for this, but... And they, and they called you to the most horrible stuff because yeah. they weren't one-off homicides. Locals could take care of that. Yeah. You're trying to study somebody who's so awful that they do this repeatedly. Yeah. The legendary Alan Smokey Burgess, chief of investigative support at the FBI Behavioral Science Unit, was Pete's boss. Klismet also worked next to a specialist named Bill Hegmeyer. Hegmeyer is one of two people sitting in a prison conference room questioning Ted Bundy just a few days prior to Bundy's execution in Old Sparky. In this section of the unredacted recording, Bundy is pleading with the FBI to stall his execution, saying he's finally ready to reveal where he hid all the bodies. The calling cards of today's politicians, the, today's compassionate politicians, is their deep respect for families. Um, okay, I'm, I'm would sound hypocritical if I would have said anything about the families of these individuals, given all the years I haven't said anything. But the fact of the matter is, they still do count. They're still out there. They still deserve to find their people. They can find their people. I can tell them how to find their people and it's up to the politicians to give me a chance, and that's the bottom line. And if they don't give me the chance, which I will take advantage of if I am given it to have the chance, if I am given the chance, they will get, they will be able to help those families that are so, that are so righteously talk about all the time and still get me. Well, it sounds to me like, you know, they have everything to gain, nothing to lose. Um, think about the predicament. I mean, again, I, I know that I'll, I know that it's going to occur to you and I know that the, the accusation has been made that I'm manipulating families, but the reality is they're out there. I, you know, they're, they're there. If we didn't talk about them, they'd still be there. Uh, there are a handful, several dozen probably, families, mothers, and you know, you know, you've seen it firsthand, and I'm sure you probably don't like me talking about it, but I'm going to talk about it. I will tell you and your fellow law enforcement officers everything I can to locate. The remains of a number of people in your state and elsewhere. And I can do that. And uh, these are, these are, this can be done. There are some of these people who don't even know that I'm involved, that is, these family members. I'm killed, they're doubly deprived. They don't even get the sense of satisfaction that they killed, the, they executed the guy who, who did it to their, their child. This way they, they, they get both the knowledge, the remains of their, their, their loved ones, and that satisfaction of some justice being done. I'm adding a small reminder here. These are 30-year-old recordings created on cassette tapes and stored in a shoebox, so audio quality might be off just a hair. But we also didn't want to overly produce them. Another very intentional choice we made, we decided to let Bundy talk for a while, uninterrupted and unedited, much like detectives did that day. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. But you've been after this for 15 years. A couple months is not going to make any difference. Listen closely to that last part one more time. A couple months is not going to make any difference. That's Bundy's voice cracking with emotion about one hour into the first day of recording. It is the only time Bundy seemingly showed emotional weakness. 
Was he crying actual tears or putting on a theatrical display to humanize himself with authorities? I put that question to Klismet. Here's the thing about Bundy. Bundy is not anywhere near as smart as he thinks he is. Bundy is a typical pathological liar. He's a typical narcissist. He's a typical um, psychopathic, sexual psychopath in his case, but psychopathic personality. You combine all of those things and um, Bundy, it's the perfect recipe for somebody that thinks he's smarter than anybody else. Now, Bundy's a smart guy. I mean, I know his IQ is 135. That's pretty good. That's as smart as most of us, you know. What he has never learned during the course of his life is there are people that are smarter than him. And I've run into a lot of these characters like this. Klismet told me he knew the raw recordings of Bundy's confessions existed in the FBI archives, but he had never heard them until Interview with Evil approached him. I could give you probably most of the, okay, the, the, the names, or some names and some locations right. if, that don't have names. Okay. okay. But this is basically what I want to avoid, okay. the, the putting myself into a position where we more or less run through the standard litany of, you know, the old, uh, uh, of, of the, you know, the, of, uh, the victims and without the depth of information and the pre the preceding antecedent stuff, what happened before, during, and after, what was going on in my mind, and that's why I feel that I want to I, I like to clothe these names in some kind of reality, even though it be a distorted reality, okay. and I I'm worried that that uh, I'm, I won't bullshit you. I'm worried that I we just run through it like this, uh, and I, I, I can understand your curiosity, believe me. But we run through it like this, and and we leave ourselves open to the temptation to uh, to, to leave it at that, right. you know. One of the things that I'm concerned about is time. I know. And I'd like to know, you haven't finished everything about George and Hawkins either. No. So we've got ten more to go. That's right. By allowing that to happen, they're allowing Bungie to control the interview. And you can't do that with this guy. And he thinks he's pulling their legs, so to speak. And, uh, and they are. Uh, they're allowing it. There came a point very early on there when I'm pointing a finger at Ted and saying, Ted, do you see this thing over here? Yeah. What is that? That's your hand. No, it isn't, Ted. That is a train. That's the engine of a train. And the engine has started, and it's running, and it's heading down the tracks. And you've got one of two choices. You're going to jump on that train, and you're going to go with it. Or that train is leaving the station, and you're not on it. You're going back to yourself. I'm tired of listening to this rambling nonsense out of your mouth. He's minimizing. Um, he's depersonalizing his involvement. He is... Um, I don't know. It's just, come on, Ted, say it. Say something. That comment brings us back to Bundy's detailed confession of the kidnapping of University of Washington freshman Georgianne Hawkins. I don't want to be too repetitive. I promise I'll get back to unheard material in a moment. But let me again play you a short segment of Bundy's confession, which aired during our first podcast. It's relevant to a pair of important new revelations we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, I was moving up the alley. Uh, using a, uh, a briefcase and some crutches. And a young woman walked down. I saw, saw her round the, the north end of the block into the alley and stop for a moment and then keep on walking down the alley toward me. And about halfway down the block, I encountered her and asked her to help me carry the briefcase. Basically, when I reached the car, what happened was I knocked her 
knocked her unconscious with the crowbar by the car outside and back of the car did she see it? no and then uh, there was some there was some handcuffs there along with the crowbar the crowbar Drivers, I mean the passenger side of the car, and drove away. So that's the setup. Bundy, pretending to be injured and in need of help, stands in a dark alley just north of the UW campus. He rapes, strangles, and decapitates Hawkins about 20 miles away in a wooded area near the town of Issaquah. After the sun rises later that same day, Bundy says he takes a huge risk and goes back to visit Hawkins' headless body. While there, he does a mental inventory of all his victims' possessions. I'm <laughs> talking about details coming back. I couldn't find one of the shoes, so I thought it was there, but it wasn't. So I went back. This was a, this was the next day. Got on my bicycle, rode back to that little parking lot. I knew there were police all over the place by that time, but I was kind of nervous because, and I'll tell you why in a minute, because I'd left, and my car had been parked there, so I may have seen it. Now something was found there that might connect me. So I went back to that parking lot and I found both. Pierced ear, the, the pierced earrings and the shoe laying in the parking lot at about five in the afternoon. So I surreptitiously gathered them up and rode off. After the police had checked that area. Well, you can tell me. I'd, I'd seen them. I'd seen whole streams of them driving around all over the place, but they were concentrating on places like the, the park, uh, mm -hmm. nearby park. I don't know if I don't. I'll, I'll bet you they couldn't have looked in the parking lot and missed. The, the patent leather, white patent leather clog and the two white pierced earrings roof hoops. Can you pause that for a second? Comical, but that's what we're <laughs> Dr. Sasha Reed that. has a PhD in serial killers. She has examined the tendencies of thousands of murderers. This part of the recording caught her attention. She says Bundy's nonchalant visit back to not one, but two crime scenes within 12 hours of snatching a teenage college girl off the streets is extraordinary. He is a risk taker. He's lived a long life kind of evading the law through all sorts of manipulative little tactics and shoplifting. Like he, he's become kind of skilled at being able to evade and avoid detection or suspicion. So I think there's already like an in, embedded comfort that he's kind of built for himself. So he knows. He's a great talker. He knows how to talk himself out of something. So I don't think that he really perceives this as a big risk for him. I really don't. Um, he knows to play it cool. And he also has that type of privilege that allows him not to be deemed suspect. He's like middle class, white male, 1970s. He's in law school. Like, no one's going to suspect him. And I think that he'll play that so hard. But... Going back to that crime scene, I mean, that's an enormous risk. And I think he knows that that's a big risk because you can't easily talk your way out of that. Collecting a shoe and earrings from a kidnapping scene while police are within sight is no doubt bold, but might also read as desperate to not get caught. Bundy's next confession, however, cannot be seen as anything but reckless, a complete inability to curtail his murderous urges. The reason I was so nervous about anything like that being found in that parking lot was <laughs> that no more than two weeks before that, I had been doing, using the same modus operandi in the same neighborhood in this, and in front, of the, in front now of the same sorority house. George Ann Hawkins disappeared from. I encountered a girl going out the door 
and asked her to help me. Walked her all the way to that lot. 11 o'clock on a Friday night. And I was, I was drunk. I was drunk and I was just babbling on. And I told her I worked in Olympia, that I lived in a rooming house. I mean, I was just, I, I was horrified later on. But I reached, uh, got all the way to the car. And it's happened, would happen sometimes. And just said, no, I don't want to do it. And I said, thank you. See you later. And she walked away. But after, after the Hawkins thing, I was, you know, just paranoid as hell that this girl would say, you know, something weird happened to me a couple of weeks ago. This guy came along with crutches and asked me to help him. He took me to a Volkswagen, and said he worked in Olympia and lived here in the university district. And how many people could that apply to? So there you are. FBI profiler Pete Klismet says Bundy is full of crap a lot of the time he speaks. But this admission felt true. Okay. Well, I mean, that shows, what does it show? It shows some planning. It shows some, some, uh, f- some forethought. Um, it probably shows some guilt about what he had done previously. And he had done, you're right, I'm sure he's done something previously. I mean, you don't wake up one morning and say, okay, so checked emails, had coffee. I think I'm going to go out and murder somebody, you know, that. There's things that is antecedent behavior uh, that manifests itself, and uh, so uh, he, yeah, he was smart in thinking out what he thought out. If if that's in fact what happened, I mean, if he didn't make this that part up. These recordings show, even though Bundy said he wanted to tell investigators everything he knows in exchange for delaying his execution, he simply can't do it. Here's a good example. Right, I could tell you exactly where some clothing was thrown, but you're not going to find anything. Not after all that time. Not along I-90 or anywhere else. Maybe we could find, I don't know where it is, but you know, the one I was thinking about is the bicycle. We've never found Janice on a bicycle. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, uh, I know what you mean. 24-year-old Janice Ott disappeared from Sammamish Lake Park July 14, 1974. Bundy said he pretended he had a broken arm, and he went to Ott and asked her to help him load a small sailboat from his Volkswagen. She agreed. He kidnapped her in broad daylight, and hoping to leave no evidence behind, he even took the yellow Tiger 10-speed bicycle she rode out to the lake to suntan that day. Is a bike something that somebody would have found on the open? I mean, some little black kids riding around. Sure. Sure. Um, probably ridden the wheels off it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a black area. Well, mixed used to be. Mm-hmm. Borderline essential area. This segment is a little harder to hear than prior cassette tapes. I'll boost the audio and reduce the hiss. Bundy's voice has changed from one of a brazen negotiator to a defeated man. And he admits the questioning is wearing him out. I'm always bad about the where one starts and the other stops. Okay. Like I feel that he's very much turned inward. The, the charisma that is so characteristic of Ted is gone. It's gone completely. Um, and that's interesting. And like I know the volume's really low, but the the tone, he's not as engaged. He's very pulled back. We never did. We actually found all we found of Janice Ott was her lower jawbone. We didn't find her skull. We found Ott's, what we think was Ott's backbone. But, you know, those animals, they just walk around out there and do their thing. Are you going to give me a hint where the rest of those bodies are? I don't know. I mean, honestly, honestly, I can't tell you. Whatever game of secrets he's playing, Bundy's time is fast running out. In the final hours on day two of the FBI session, his voice is barely audible. Testing, one, two, three. Mm-hmm. The scale of papers are talking about saying all sorts of other racial things. Tonight. That's partly due to detectives moving the cassette recorder's microphone and partly because Bundy admits that he's just about done talking. However, I think this next segment is worth straining to hear. 
I'd like to know, Miss. Y'all from Thurston County? Bundy? Where's she? Bundy is trying to explain to Bob Keppel why detectives are going to have a nearly impossible time finding the body of Donna Gail Manson. She was a 19-year-old freshman at Evergreen State College in the Tacoma area and went missing on her way to a jazz concert in 1974. I won't beat her on the bush with you anymore, so I'm just tired and I just want to get back and go to sleep. Okay. So let me just tell you, I'm, I know that it's part of the area up in there, but nothing identifiable, probably just literally bones. The head, however, the, the skull, it wouldn't be there. Where is it? It's nowhere. Bundy said part of his victim is buried up on the mountainside near Issaquah, but he removed her head, cut her up, and spread the bones out along Powerline Road. And when detectives ask specifically where, he dismissively replied, nowhere. It turns out he decided to take Manson's head to his girlfriend's house in Seattle, and he burned it in the fireplace. It's nowhere. Well, I don't know. I'm not trying to be flippant. It's just, it just, it's nowhere. It's, 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 it's in a category by itself. In, in that uh, it was, now I just assumed this was something that he just kept, I don't know that I can see the headlines now, but. Uh, uh, Ted, there's not going to be any details. What, what you told me about Georgian Hawkins isn't going to be known. i got parents out there that don't even want to know the details. Well, I know. Uh, but he yeah. wants to know, and I want to know for my own good. Yeah, well, it, it was incinerated, and it was. Just uh, an exception, uh, a strange exception, but uh, it was incinerated. Where'd you incinerate it? <laughs> Come on, partner. <laughs> These are things they don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, this is this is probably the, the, the disposal method of preference among those who get away with it. Yeah. But because uh, the um, it's the most bizarre, bizarre thing I've ever, ever been associated with, and I've been associated with some bizarre shit. Right. It's incinerated. It's incinerated. Well, tell me about it. What the hell happened? Well, I uh, don't know the address of the place. I never want to tell this, and the process I would never tell this because it was, uh, I, I thought that of, of all the things I did to this woman, this is probably what she was least likely to forgive me for. Poor Liz, mm -hmm. in her fireplace, uh, it's really not that humorous, but uh, in the fireplace at that house. Bring it all up. Down to the last ash and then a fit of you know paranoia, cleanliness, whatever, you just uh, packing down all the ashes. Mm -hmm. That's the twist. Yeah, that's a slight twist. Yeah. It's a twist and uh, it's a lot of work and, and certainly very risky. Circumstances. I mean, the kids come home from school and there's a roaring fire in the fireplace and it's warm outside. To summarize, Bundy reiterated it's not that humorous that he burned the skull down to the last ash in a fit of cleanliness. He admits it's a twist and a lot of work. He also said it was risky. His girlfriend, whose name was Liz, had children and they arrived home from school while he was still in the middle of getting rid of the evidence. Two of our serial killer experts actually disagreed on if Bundy was telling the whole truth. They also disagreed on why he might have shared the skull burning story. The voice, once again, goes down. I mean, it goes down a couple of octaves. What does that mean? That 
he thinks he's going into sincerity mode. You know, he's like the priest in the confessional uh, or, or the penitent in the confessional, and he's afra almost afraid to say what he did. And uh, then that makes it more sincere if you go into that, that voice uh, that he did. But the other part of that is uh, he thinks now, because I've told them I incinerated that head, that he's given him something significant that's going to be a big revelation to them. It's like an epiphany. Oh, my God, you know, what a big deal that is. It is nothing, you know. Will an entire head burn up? Sure, well, what won't burn? The glossy whites. So where did, you know, the ashes go, Ted? Did they scrape them down the little clean-out thing? Uh, what happened to them? Come on, Ted. I was born at night. It was not last night. Now tell me what happened to that head. He mentions cleanliness, which I think is really interesting. I don't know what he means exactly by cleanliness, um, throwing skulls in fireplaces, because you know it's not biological cleanliness, because he's been doing things that are not cleanly at all. But cleanliness, I think, in the psychological sense, burning something. Fire has this all-consuming power. It can reduce something, like he said, to ash. And I think that there's something very psychologically cathartic about that. If you've been intrigued with the discussion over the past three weeks of Ted Bundy's admissions related to the kidnapping and murder of George Ann Hawkins, I have a really cool and exciting referral for you. In the coming weeks, a group of augmented reality video designers will be launching a new app called Crime Door. They have recreated the Hawkins kidnapping scene with incredible detail. You'll be able to enter a portal via the Crime Door app and walk around that University of Washington parking lot with Ted Bundy and George Ann Hawkins. You'll be able to see that crowbar, his crutches, the Volkswagen bug with a missing seat, and all the other pieces of evidence in stunning, accurate detail. If you like video games, you will go nuts for this. Watch for Crime Door, available for download on iTunes and all your other favorite formats. I've been lucky enough to see this scene during beta testing, and it is incredible. I'll have more details soon. And by the way, Patreon has decided the content from this podcast must be labeled adult. Because of that, they have blocked my account from showing up in any search. If you'd like to see what they're so afraid to release, you can still visit the page, but you'll have to go through our website at interviewwithevil.com. We'll release another Raw segment exclusively to our Patreon subscribers in two weeks. In the meantime, the next Interview with Evil podcast will drop on Monday and be widely available. I'll warn you, it's graphic. I hope the streaming services don't block it. We speak with a famous homicide detective from the Pacific Northwest, Sheriff and former Congressman Dave Reichert. He tells an amazing story of being in Bundy's presence. We're going to look at the connection between Bundy and another even more prolific serial killer. Gary Ridgway.